This is part four of our series of lectures on infinite sets, and in this lecture I'm going to prove that every infinite subset of the natural numbers is denumerable. So you'll recall that we proved a while back that the set of even natural numbers is also denumerable, and that sort of illustrates this theorem. The set of even natural numbers is a is an infinite subset of the natural numbers, yet it turned out to be it turned out to have exactly the same cardinality of the natural numbers. So this theorem is saying that there's no way to get an infinite subset that's any less in size from the point of view of cardinality than the entire set of natural numbers. So let's say we have an infinite subset of the natural numbers and we're going to try to prove that it is denumerable, so that means we have to find a bijection from n into a. So how can we do that? Well, let's begin by writing the elements of A in increasing order, assuming that it's possible for us to do that. Then what we'll do in, in defining our function f is we're going to let f of 1 be the very smallest element, A1. Then we'll let f of 2 be the next smallest element, f of 3 the next smallest element, etc. That's the idea. But we don't really have the elements of A in, arranged in increasing order, and it's, it's not clear how, how we might do that. And so all we really have is our set A, so we want to somehow be able to describe what we've just done. The device we use in order to make the description rigorous is that we make use of the well-ordering property of the natural numbers. So what we do is we define f of 1, in order to get this element here, that's the smallest element of set A, so we just simply define f of 1 to be the smallest element of A. We know that there is such a thing. Next, we take our set A and we remove f of 1 from it, and we then take the smallest element of the resulting set, and that's what we call f of 2. And then we continue the process. We'll define f of 3 to be the smallest element of the set A with the previous two values removed. Now, the correct way to actually do this process, uh, to write it up in a proof, is to do things inductively. So I'll, I'll explain that. You'll see how I do that when I actually write down the proof. Then once we have our F defined, then we'll have to prove that it's in fact a bijection. So let's get started with the proof. Okay, so here's the formal proof. We're going to prove that every infinite subset of the natural numbers is denumerable. So we start with an infinite subset of n, we call it a, and we're going to define f from the natural numbers into a inductively as follows. We define f of 1 to be the smallest element of a, and now we give ourselves an n, at least 2. We assume that f of 1 up to f of n minus 1 are all, all already defined, and then we define f of n to be the smallest element of the set um, of the subset of A with all of these elements removed. Now the fact that A is assumed to be an infinite set, right, that's our hypothesis, tells us that regardless of how big our n is, this is always a finite set, and therefore there's always something remaining here. It's never empty and therefore it's a non-empty subset of the natural numbers, and therefore it must have a smallest element, and so we can define our f of n that way. So I'm going to leave it as an exercise for you using PCI to show that this process here defines f of n for all natural numbers n. So now we just have to prove that it's injective and that it's surjective. So here's the proof of injectivity. To see that f is injective, we're actually going to prove the stronger result that it's in fact increasing. So give yourself an i and a j in the natural numbers and assume that i is smaller than j. And so what's the definition of f of i? f of i is defined to be the smallest element of the subset of a with these elements removed. Well, since j is bigger than i, that means at this stage f of j has not yet been removed and f of i is defined to be the very, very smallest element of this big set here. Well, f of j must still be an element of that set because we haven't gotten to it yet. If f of j were smaller than f of i, then we would have picked it at this stage. But f of i is the smallest element of this set, and since f of j is still in it, that means that f of i must be strictly smaller than f of j. 
So that proves that F is increasing, and so in particular it's also injective. Let's now turn to the proof that F is surjective. Well, I'm going to argue using contradiction. Let's suppose that F is not surjective, and that means the range of F is a proper subset of A. In other words, if I take the set theoretic difference, A minus the range of F, I get a non-empty subset of N, and therefore it must have a smallest element, and I'm going to call that smallest element B. So notice that it's impossible for B to be F of 1, because F of 1 is the very smallest element of A. So B has to be bigger than F of 1. F of 1 is, by definition, in the range of F. All right, so B is the smallest element of A that's not in the range. Um, and so all of the elements of A which are smaller than B are in the range. So let me, before I go through the, the rest of the proof, let me show you a picture to, um, just to motivate what I'm about to do. So here you see I've listed all of the elements of A, and I've circled in red um, some of the elements that are conceivably not in the range. And remember we said let B be the very smallest element of A, uh, which is not in the range. So that means all of the elements to the left of B are in the range. And so what I wanted, so what I do is I call um, this set here all of the elements of A that are smaller than B. I, I'm going to call that set T in the proof. And then I focus on the very, very biggest element of T. So you notice that B is an upper bound for this set T. It's bigger than or equal to every element of T. And so I claim that I can then pick the biggest element of this set T, and I'm going to call that in the proof C. Okay, so since C is smaller than B, then that must mean that C is in the range of F. So C must be F of N for some natural number N, and then you ask yourself, well, how do you get f of n plus 1? Well, f of n plus 1 is obtained by taking a and removing all of these elements, and then taking the smallest element that remains. And, of course, that's just b. And that's, by definition, what you would call f of n plus 1. And there you get your contradiction, because that then says that b is in the range, uh, and yet b is supposedly the smallest element of a that's not in the range. So that's the idea of what we're about to do. Let's get back to the details. Okay, so as I said before, B is the smallest element of A that's not in the range. I let T be all of the elements of A which are less than B. Uh, then T is a non-empty subset of A, because, for example, F of 1 is definitely in T. And it has an upper bound, namely B is an upper bound. B is bigger than or equal to every element of that set. And then I claim that T must therefore have a largest element. So you might want to look back at lecture 2.5, part 13, where I prove the result um, using principle of mathematical induction that every non-empty upper bounded subset of N has a largest element. So I now apply that to this T. T must have a largest element, and I'm going to call it C. And so by definition, C is smaller than B, and therefore it is in the range. Um, and so there must exist a natural number such that f of n is C. And now you ask yourself, how do you define f of n plus 1? Well, it's the smallest element of A in which we've removed all of these elements. Um, but, but that's exactly B. And therefore, B must be f of n plus 1 by definition, and that contradicts the assumption that B is not in the range, because this indicates that B is in the range. Okay, so that contradiction establishes that f is in fact surjective. And that completes the proof.